about, I'm going to talk to you guys today about some case studies of brands that have joined the conversation. When I first started out and submitted for PodCamp, I wanted to talk about getting market intelligence through social media channels. So I'm going to integrate that into what I'm talking about because I think what's important about it is that anything that somebody's saying on social media about you, they're probably saying about your competitors as well and your competitors' products. So um, it really does kind of fit together, and that's what we're going to talk about today. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm Peter Bergelli. So um, I went ahead and put it up there for you in case you want to go ahead and type it in because it's very exciting. Uh, but my job is with Direct Energy. So uh, Direct Energy Business sponsors this, but I work in our residential mass markets, and my job is market intelligence. So I kind of, when people ask me what I do, I like to tell them I'm a corporate spy because it sounds really sexy to say that. But uh, really, it's just my job to know about our competitors and what's going on in our marketplace. But one of the things that I've been working on for the past year is our social media strategy. And so bringing that into our corporate culture and building the business case for that, um, which I think is going to help me give you, thank you, some good information here. I am from Houston, so I came all the way up here to Pittsburgh for my first time this weekend, and I think I'm going to adopt this city as like a second home. <laughs> it's a really neat place. Um, I went to school at the University of Texas in Austin. Oh, no. <laughs> But, um, but, do what? Oh, well, sorry for your loss. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Pittsburgh reminds me a little bit of, I would say, if Austin and Houston had a baby, it would be like Pittsburgh because it's a great <laughs> metropolitan area, but it's very friendly and, um, and very much on the leading edge in thought leadership for especially technology and social media. Um, I don't own a jacket. I had to buy a sweater to come here. And I think it's really cute that I've been watching you Pittsburghers. Is that correct? Okay. Pittsburghers. Pittsburghers. I've been watching you guys like run around in the city with your jackets and your earmuffs. And and I'm when I left Houston, it was 105 degree heat index and 97 percent humidity. So every time I walk out of the hotel, I'm like, oh, it's great. Um, and my shuttle bus leaves at three o'clock. So. We're going to get through this information, and certainly tweet me if you have any additional questions that I'm not able to answer. But um, as soon as I'm done here, I've got to head back to my hotel to catch my shuttle bus and get on my plane. So just yeah. so that you know. Do you know how long it takes to get your hotel? Do what? Yeah, 10 minutes. I, um, if I hope that I can do it in 7, I've done some dry runs this morning. So I'm prepared. And I wore comfortable shoes, so I'm ready to go. Um, so that's a little bit about me. But one of the things that I thought that I would do is give you a perspective of what y'all are looking like to me today. <laughs> All right? so I promise myself I'm not going to be nervous. I'm not going to be nervous. <laughs> so, okay, just imagine this is, this is your, my perspective of you. But what I think is kind of a question that's really redundant here, right? So is anybody really using social media? Yeah, of course they are. And we all know that, right? But I wanted to give you some stats because, again, my background is in, in analytics. So I kind of live on data. And I wanted to give you some stats about it. By 2010, Gen Y is going to outnumber the baby boomers. And 96% of them have joined a social network. One out of eight couples married in the US last year met through social media. OK, so this is an interesting one. It took radio 13, 38 years and television 13 years to reach 50 million viewers iPhone apps have gone to 2 billion in about the past year. So there really is a, a big surge with, with social media and sharing of information, which I think we're all aware of. But just to put it in perspective, if Facebook was its own country, it would be the fourth largest between the US and Indonesia. So that's pretty interesting, right? There's a lot. So obviously, there's a lot of people there. And YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. Now, the next stat that I wanted to give you guys um, was that social networking has actually overtaken porn as the um, number one activity on the web. I couldn't really find a picture that I was going to show you guys. So, um, we're, you know, I'm just going to share that with you without giving you the visual. But what does it mean? When we're talking about our branding, when we're talking about how to interact, when we're talking about gaining intelligence about your market, what does all of this social media mean? Simply, we are not in Kansas. Right? 
So our traditional views of brand loyalty, looking at our markets, doing research, demographics, that has all changed. There is, we are in a completely different world. So we're in a world that tweets over 3 million tweets a day. That there's over 200 million Facebook users and they have an average of about 100 friends. And then the number of blogs indexed is incredible, right, on Technorati. So the number of internet users who are actually reading blogs is about 77%. So people who are online, people who are discussing things with each other, they're very well connected and those networks continue to grow. We are bombarded. I heard in Bethany's session this morning, you know, somebody mentioned about the number of ads that people see every day, right? On average, 3,000 ads that we see every day. But you know what? We hate them. We hate them. Who has a, who has a DVR? Right? Okay, so when you record something, do you watch your commercials? No? 90% of people will skip ads if they're given the choice. They'll skip it. They don't even want to hear it. So what that tells us, though, is interestingly, about the same percentage expect companies that should have a presence in social media. So these people, these folks that we want to reach out to with our brands and with our personal brands, even, and I'm not talking just to corporate brands, right? We all have personal brands. When I introduce myself, I introduce myself as peanut butter jelly, right? It's kind of my personal brand. You don't want to hear an ad, right? But you would expect that I would be involved in social media in some way. Not only that, people want to be able to interact with the brands. I love this picture because Disney does such a great job with their brand, right? They're a huge brand. They're known worldwide. But when it comes down to it, little Missy wants to talk to Princess Aurora. She wants to interact with that brand, with that story that she's been told. Is anybody familiar with the Clue Trade Manifesto? Have you guys heard of that? This is a really interesting um, piece of work that is about 10 years old. In fact, if you go on Amazon, you can buy the 10-year anniversary of the Clue Train Manifesto. What it is, is 95 theses that explain how the market's changing. So I'm going to take you through some of that since um, I didn't know how, you know, where we'd be in the group, so I wanted to give you an overview of this. But this 95 thesis, it starts off, if you Google it and you go to the page, it starts off, people of Earth, markets are changing. Markets do not behave the way that they used to. And then they go into these 95 theses about how markets have changed. Markets are conversations. How many times have you heard that in the past couple of days? Markets are conversations. Markets, it's all about dialogue. It's all about conversation. Well, what they mean by this is that you have to be human, right? So you can't come off with the same marketing messages, the same marketing jargon. Being human is something that is unique. It is funny. It's sometimes shocking, right? But it is, it's a unique conversation that people have between each other. We're going to have a conversation between us that you're not going to hear me uh, give a tagline in our conversation about a brand, right? It's a totally different conversation. But in addition to that, the brand loyalty that we used to know is like the corporate version of going steady. And markets are so well connected now, and people are so well connected in their markets, that they're willing to renegotiate those relationships at blinding speed. There's not anything that you, know, you can build, if you go into the old method of building brand loyalty, it's going to fall flat. Why? Because people are expecting different things of you, and they're not afraid to find a new boyfriend. The cat is out of the bag, you guys. There are no secrets. Does anybody remember a couple of years ago when Walmart decided to delve into social media, send some bloggers on the road? Do so you remember that? Tell the group. No. <laughs> Who else? Does anybody else remember it? Want to share? No. Okay. So, uh, mommy bloggers, right? Kind of a big thing. People started to realize that when mommies endorsed products, that people would listen and they would go and buy those products. Well, Walmart said we should totally get in on this. So they started a blog of these people that were going to Walmart across America. And they were in their little RV or the van or something, and they were blogging as they were going along the way and, and talking about their experience. Well, it turns out that 
Walmart was paying them to do it. And people found out about it. Why? Because the networks are so connected. These people are talking about products, and they know more about the products than the company does. And so they found out about it, and Walmart took a really big hit on this because it violated that rule of authenticity. They were going out and paying somebody and trying to make it look like it was something that it wasn't. So there are no secrets. You have to be authentic when you're talking about your brand, when you're engaging with your publics. The other thing is that people are usually laughing at you. And, you know, um, when you talk about companies, so how often have you gone somewhere that you're like, seriously? This is what you're, the filet of fish thing, right? That they showed us yesterday in one of the sessions. People are laughing at that. Laughing so much that those guys went and did all spoof on it, right? Because it was funny. So what this is, is basically though, McDonald's didn't sue them. Why? Because McDonald's has a sense of humor. That doesn't mean that you're going to start posting jokes on your website or your Twitter or start joking about your brand. But brands really have to lighten up. Don't take yourself so seriously. Because we're not taking it seriously. We don't even want to watch your ad. So if you're not, if we're not taking you seriously, why are you taking yourself so seriously, especially with your branding? And this is a really interesting time because companies have the opportunity to communicate directly with their markets. And it could be the last chance that they get. So the manifesto talks about that if these communities don't evolve, if companies don't evolve to be part of the community, they're going to die. It's their last chance to be able to interact with their consumers on a different level. The dog and pony show, nobody's listening. Again, ads. Who's, do you guys listen to like a couple of different radio stations? Right? So you're listening to a radio station and an ad comes on, what do you do? Switch it? Switch it? Do you, when you're watching TV and an ad comes on, I think this, I'm so ADD. Because um, <laughs> I'll do this, I'll be watching a show, and ad will come on, I'll switch to something else, and I'll watch that show until the ad comes on, and then I'll try to go back to the show that I was watching before. And so I end up like seeing half the sh both shows, but I've missed all the ads, right? Because I don't, I'm not really interested in your dog and pony show. You can say, and this, it's always those made for TV ones, right? The sham wow, the slap chop, the snuggie that they talked about yesterday, but they're always, or the, the snore away, right? The snore away, okay, I'll just tell you guys. Uh, oh yeah, sorry for watching. Um, my husband got one. The little snore thing that you put in, it's going to end snoring. It doesn't. <laughs> it really doesn't. And I watched the ad, and they're talking about how this is going to eliminate snoring, and you'll sleep better, and your health is better, and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, this, thing, this is just a bunch of hooey. It's hooey, right? And we know it, but it's the dog and pony show. And guess what? My sweet husband, and if I can give you just a little insight, bless his heart, he would be happy in this world if he had a rotary phone and a pen, pencil and a piece of paper. The internet stuff, he just is not into social networking. And as such, I like to um, tease him that I've created a Facebook page and a Twitter for him. And then he has a lot of followers and people really enjoy his pictures. Um, but what, he, what happened with him was that um, somebody at work, I had tweeted about something I was making for dinner. And somebody that we work with came up and said, hey, how'd you like the turkey tacos? And he said, what? How'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> what did I have for dinner? You know? And um, my, my friend who had followed me just went, well, is that it? Did you enjoy it? So on the way home, he's going, I don't know how Bill knew. And I said, well, I tweeted it. <gasps> what? That's an invasion of privacy, right? So he's freaking out because he's, he's thinking that people know details about his life, right? But it's really, I'm thinking it's no big deal. They do, but I mean, they eat turkey tacos. Yes, he was flipped. He thought somebody was looking up through our windows, right? <laughs> so, it, but what it comes down to is that it was human, right? We were, I was just having a conversation with people that are my Twitter followers. And if you're only focused on your jargon, which is, I think, and we'll talk about this when we talk about one of the case studies, one of the big hurdles for that company was to teach people not to use the jargon, not to use the marketing speak not to use the PR speech or the pitch on everything because people aren't listening and you're not talking to anybody, so you're wasting your time. The community of discourse is the market. Companies have to realize where their corporate culture ends and the community begins. 
And if the corporate culture ends before the community begins, then they're out of luck. They've got to be part of the community, but they have to realize that that community is this community of people who are talking about their products before they enter that community. So unless they're part of that community, unless they're willing to hear what people have to say, they're out of luck. Those companies will die, according to this manifesto. And I tend to agree with that. If companies aren't willing to engage me and to learn, because I'm their consumer, I'm paying their bills, right? I'm paying their paycheck. And if they're not willing to convince me that the products that they have are worth me buying and that they're interested in what I have to say because I'm the one using the product, I'm not interested in spending my money with that company. The point of this is, though, and a lot of people, you may run up against this, and let's take a quick poll. Um, are, is, does anybody work for a company that is engaging in social media or are you doing it for your personal use? Personal? Personal, personal business. Personal business, okay. So one thing that I've learned is that in companies, people, want, leadership wants to know how's this gonna make us money? What's our, what's our ROI on this, right? Well, you can still make money, but it can't be the first thing on your mind. You have to throw out the old rules of brand loyalty and what's gonna make it, people say, oh, I really love this company. No longer is it that, you know what, um, Chick-fil-A has the best chicken sandwiches. Love Chick-fil-A. Because I can get a chicken sandwich anywhere, but it's going to depend on how that company interacts with me and how that, how that company makes me feel about buying your product. So you still can make money. It just can't be the first thing on your mind. And the interesting thing is somebody proved it. This group did a research study on the 100 top global brands, the most valuable brands, and they found a correlation between the amount of engagement that a brand is involved in and their financial measurements. And there was a direct correlation between companies that were really engaged and really involved with their customers and having improved financial performance. I'm so excited about this, you guys, because everybody's always saying, oh, that's social media, it's not, you know, it's just awareness. It's just, it's just marketing, it's just public relations, it's not turning into sales. These guys proved it was, which I think is totally great, because as we're moving forward, um, this is a discussion that you can have with your leadership. You know, the guy who's like, well, it's really all about sales numbers. It's really all about sales numbers. Well, this is something that you can't use, and I just have to say this out loud, and I know you guys know this, but you can't use social media as a push channel. It's not a push channel. You can't push market through social media. But if you're engaged with your customers, because if you push, you're going to turn into an ad and they're going to ignore you. So if you engage with your customers, though, there's a correlation between that and your financial performance. A couple of the case studies that I want to talk about. First, I want to talk about Starbucks. Does anybody drink Starbucks? Anybody? Do you like it? Yeah? Not the coffee? Not the coffee? <laughs> <laughs> what do you like at Starbucks? It's like soy latte. Okay. Straight out coffee. Have you ever had the chai with the soy? No. Oh my god, it's good stuff. The white hot chocolate. The white hot chocolate? Who else has a favorite drink at Starbucks? Let's share it. What is it? Water. I like the chai. Water? No. <laughs> <laughs> and you like the chai? What about you? Huh? Mocha. Mocha? I'm old school. I like the latte. You like the latte? <laughs> like the latte? Anyone else? Favorite Starbucks drink? Okay, so in the spirit of full disclosure, I worked my way through college working at Starbucks. I love Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks is the reason that I changed from advertising to public relations in my degree. Because I was fascinated by the way that they engaged with people and the way that they marketed that they never had a commercial. And this is, you know, years ago. But even on Friends, where they were in, don't remember Friends? Right? That's what show. Okay, so even in that show, they're in Central Perk, they had Starbucks mugs in their hands. <laughs> right? And I knew this because I worked there, but I thought, how subliminal. Like, you don't even realize, like, how much you want to be that person at Central Perk, but to do that, you have to go to Starbucks and get that mug. Or you have to get that green straw. You know the green straw? Everybody knows it's a Starbucks cup. It's got a green straw, right? So I love Starbucks because not only did they take really good care of me as an employee, 
They gave me full medical, de medical dental, visual, and stock options for working part-time. Plus, they gave me a free pound of coffee a week and all the coffee I could drink while I was working there. So I was really, really happy, and I had health insurance. So it's healthy and happy, right? And I went to work all the time because I was addicted to what I was selling. But they have a really interesting approach. Has anybody um, seen Starbucks on Twitter? Yeah, you have? Yeah, Starbucks on Twitter, they're on Facebook, right? Well, they looked at, in the study that we were talking about, they looked at these brands and how they engage. And with Starbucks, they identified, and even the next case study we're going to talk about, they identified the top things that these companies did that made that engagement successful, right? So the first thing that Starbucks did was they deputized people throughout the company um, to be involved. Now, Starbucks is a very well-known and protected brand. They do protect their brand a lot. But they said, we want to do this, and we know it's going to affect people in the organization outside of marketing. We know it's going to affect people in the organization outside of just what we've decided to do. So they talked to the product development people. They brought in people from all lines of business and said, OK, we want to get you involved in this. And what they did was they came up with my Starbucks idea. Has anybody seen this site? Yeah? So you get, um, you register for an account, and then you can go and you can submit an idea of something that's going to make Starbucks more valuable to you. Has anybody noticed um, you go to Starbucks and they make your drink and they put on the thing? You know, sometimes if you're heading to the car, it used to spill out of the top of the lid, right? And then now they have this little things, right, with a siren on top that came from my Starbucks idea. Somebody said, why don't you make a little stopper, right? Well, so this went into product development. And they said, here's something that our customers are asking us for. We think it would enhance their experience with us. How can we develop something? So that came from my Starbucks idea. The other thing was a mini Starbucks card that became really successful for them to have this kind of mini card. Everybody loves their little Starbucks card. You get them as gifts, you can reload them, you can transfer balances, you know, all, if you register for it and you lose it, then they retain your balance. It's a very nice little product that they offer. These ideas that are generated from the community and then people in that community have the opportunity to vote on it, right? So people say, hey, that's a great idea. I really like that idea. And that gives a communication, a discourse with Starbucks so that they can know what it is that really matters to their customers. What is it that, that is really important or an idea that may be really simple to apply, but it's going to make a big difference. And then the customers in return are going to know that Starbucks is listening to them. The customers are going to continue to spend their money there because Starbucks actually gives a crap what you think about their product, right? Um, other than the water, is it just like a glass of water? Or <laughs> no, but they do have a good bottle of water. They do have a good bottle of water. And you know, another interesting thing about that bottle of water is that those proceeds go back to charity to help the communities where they buy the coffee from. So on a lot of different levels, I love this company. But they also understood that each channel is different. And each channel is a different dimension of engagement, right? Facebook's different from Twitter. MySpace is different from Delicious, right? So each, each of these channels are going to require a different kind of engagement, a different level of engagement. And the way that they looked at this was with Facebook. One of the things that they did was go in to Facebook, and there were all these accounts that were managed by private users. And they said, well, we want to be involved in Facebook. So they contacted those administrators and said, can we participate with you in your Starbucks fan page? So instead of just going in and going, we're the big company, and we're going to take over, and you know, we're going to have our own branded Facebook page, they went to the people who were already their fans and were already interested in talking about their products and said, can we be part of this conversation with you? And you work with um, Rose's Cafe mm -hmm. in Texas? It's kind of a right because and this goes back to what we talked about when I talked about the clue train manifesto 
the community of discourse is already there, right? People are already talking about your brand. They're already talking about you. Join the community and become part of the conversation instead of saying, you know, it's not, the way I like to phrase it is it's not build it and they will come. It's find it and go there, you know, and join into that community. So that's what they did. And they had a lot of success because I was laughing about this. Has anybody tried the VIA? The instant coffee? It, do you, you did? You didn't like it? Yeah, I can tell it. Like, I just thought it was kind of interesting. Uh, it was kind of gritty. Uh, yeah. It didn't dissolve well or whatever. Okay, that's totally fair. Okay. Right? You're not a fan. This lady is. Carla was really excited. Not you, Carla. But, <laughs> but uh, I bought some to come on my trip. I haven't tried it yet, but if I met these poor people in the elevator this morning and had really bad coffee in the hotel room, I'm like, here, have a Dina, right? Um, I like that it's portable. I mean, there's some convenience to it, right? They make a cup that they actually fit in, which is really nice, but that was a great concept. And then actually, if you were at Starbucks, you have a gold card, mm -hmm. they sent out the uh, to that. And like, you know, just log into your, if you log in and check your account every so often, you just click the button and send it to you free. Yeah. Cool. What, that is a really cool idea. I first got my first sample of Via. Um, we have this ride in Houston. It's called the MS150. It's a bike ride from Houston to Austin um, to raise money for multiple sclerosis. And the company that I work for, Direct Energy, sponsors a team every year. Well, you stop halfway through, right? So I had my Via and I was ready. And then I woke up and I was like, oh, I got to ride. I need the time to get my hot water and get the the coffee, but it was a great concept just to have that little bit of coffee that you could make one cup with. But people are talking about other things. They're talking about the, their frappuccino. They're discussing the things that they like here. And when they started the mini Starbucks card, so they put it on their Facebook page, and then like something like 1,200 people made a comment about it, and then another 14,000 liked it. So what, you know, just, Thumbs up, right? So people are liking it, but that's so they're not just discussing with their fans about their products on their pages. Their fans are talking about their products with their friends, and so the reach is a lot bigger um, than if they were just trying to completely control this community. They let it be organic. They let it grow. They let people be, you know, talking about it in their own news streams, right? So I go in and I say, I like this shows up in my newsfeed, then my hundred friends see it, and then so on and so on and so on. The other thing that they've done is, as far as different dimensions on Twitter, right, so we've got 338,727 followers. They've got one person that's managing this account. They have a team of six for all of their social media efforts. But this really becomes a kind of in-the-moment response from Starbucks. So if you have questions about products, if you have questions about replacement parts, if you have questions about, um, you know, just saying, gosh, coffee, thank God for coffee, right? Then um, you can just tweet that to them, and they're very appreciative. And you have this, so you have this one guy or this one girl um, who's managing all of this account, but it creates an in the moment for them that they can go, they can immediately impact what their customers are thinking and talking about on, on Twitter. The other thing that they did, and I cracked up when I saw this, have y'all ever seen Starbucks headquarters? They put the siren on the top, right, on their clock tower. This cracked me up, kind of this, you know, I can just imagine in Seattle, it's always looking at you, right? <laughs> they centralized it. So one of the big challenges for them was that as much as people who work for Starbucks want to be tweeting about Starbucks, they have to control that. And kind of, the, the quote that I read was that for as many things as we've done right, we've had to shut a lot of stuff down because they don't have a totally open brand concept where anybody can be representing the Starbucks brand. And they're pretty good about this as well. On, and they have a lot of monitoring that goes on online from eBay, to, you know, in Twitter, to looking for employees who may say inappropriate things, which we talked about a little bit yesterday with the Berg blog lady. Um, so they are really looking at this, but it's part of maintaining that brand image, yet they're still engaging enough 
that they're able to get the highest engagement score and continue. Starbucks has not had an easy time, you guys, right? Everybody's all oh, the mom and pop coffee shops are gone, and I don't want to pay four dollars for coffee, and Dunkin' Donuts is coming in, and McDonald's is coming in. But they've helped to keep their engaged customers by being by following some of these steps. The other thing that they did was find a champion who could mitigate risk. Right? So they had top-down support. Howard Schultz, who founded and then came back to run Starbucks again, um, was one of the guys who said, we really need to be doing this. And this is going to be a, a corporate priority for us. Because, and one thing that I can just say, I guess I can say from an insider's perspective, is that uh, when I worked there, it wasn't about like people are just coming through for fast food coffee. It was, and one thing that I noticed, people considered that my Starbucks. That's my Starbucks. That's the one I go to. We were expected to learn people's names, right? And then you got the guy who comes in and gets the weird drink. Well, you know, Americana Bob is coming in and he's going to get his specialized drink. You just started, right? So it's that relationship. I knew Americana Bob was coming in every day. Yeah. There would be the your yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. You're not at work. You're at Starbucks. It's true. It's true. And um, when I was in culinary school, I, another girl that I was in school with worked at Starbucks too. And our two chefs, and this is where it really hit me, was our, we had two chefs. And one chef goes, well, she works at my Starbucks. And oh, well, she works at my Starbucks. And I was like, they think they own the Starbucks. It's theirs. Like, we only go and work to make their coffee, right? But what they've done successfully is to take that relationship across from the storefront, the bricks and mortar, and move it into an online space where people feel like, yes. On the other hand, they kind of have to do that because there are Starbucks on every corner. Yeah. In a place like Washington, D.C., you've got them right across the street from one of them. You know? And so here's my Starbucks is the only way to distinguish it. Right. That's mine, right? But if you still got one on, there's a area in a, in Houston where they call it Four Corners because there's four Starbucks. There's one on every corner. <laughs> I'm not even playing because that way, no matter which direction you're going, there's always a Starbucks at that intersection that you can stop by that's convenient to get in and out. You know, but people really do get that sense of ownership. And so what I think is interesting about this case study is that they've taken that engagement that they have with their customers in the store face-to-face -face with the baristas and moved it into that online space. Do y'all have any questions about that case study? No? Is that interesting to y'all? Yep, yes. I think uh, I follow up like, a lot of social media stuff. I think Starbucks is one of the big companies that's actually done social media the right way of engaging customers and things like that. Uh, so many other companies will just put up a Facebook, put up a blog, and it's just. It becomes static. Yeah, it's just not. Yeah. They don't update it, and like, Starbucks doesn't. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. I, that's one of the things I really enjoy about that company is that they they have and what it, again I didn't write this study. This is somebody else who acknowledged this, but they really have I think done a good job because I think that they looked at their brand positioning and said we want to take this experience and move it into the next phase. Did you have something to say? It was just a comment as part of the how some bigger companies are taking. Um, you know, when they listen online on Twitter, you know, uh, I've heard people talk about customer service online and listen to that. Um, I texted it out one day and just tweeted, this Google Voice, the invitation started going out. I had my Google account for Google, it didn't exist, and I had it on the invite. So I tweeted, why haven't I got my Google, you know, I hashed it, Google Voice invite, I've been da da da. Within an hour, I had my Google Voice invite in my mailbox. That's awesome. Could have been pure coincidence, but no, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't. And I'm going to take that from the perspective of that um, within my role, I part of what I do is monitor a, a tool called Radiant Six, which is a social media monitoring tool. And so I can get alerts in my inbox when somebody um, tweets or writes on a blog or something about um, the keywords that I put in. Did you have a question? Radiant Six. Radiant Six. Radiant Six. R A B I A N, and the number six. And they're on Twitter too, so you can tweet over them and they'll be like, hey, that's awesome. Um, but they're a really neat tool because they've given us the opportunity to do a lot of keyword searches. And from our corporate perspective, and I think, Bethany, do you get those alerts? 
the uh -huh. Yeah, we have the subgroup. Yeah, so I, I, I act as the admin there. And then if I find something that applies to what Bethany does here, I can shoot it over to her immediately. So it comes to her attention and she can respond. So it wasn't a coincidence. They are paying attention. I mean, I wasn't like saying nasty things. I just wanted to test out the... Same thing happened to me with, with Chick-fil-A. I said, oh, well, I love Chick-fil-A or at Chick-fil-A. That was kind of a mediocre lunch, you know? And they DM'd me and said, well, what was wrong? It's like waffle fries kind of sucks. And, you know, <laughs> I like the waffle fries. Those are kind of important. Yes. Yeah, that happened not that long ago. With, uh, somebody, I guess, upset at Comcast. And mm -hmm. I called, and I called for somebody to be here, and they can't do it this week. And then, you know, Comcast immediately sends somebody over. At Comcast Cares. Yeah. yeah is uh, they've done. A, they're another example yeah. of a company that's taken their customer service into social media. And uh, you know, I even had an issue. I'm not a Comcast customer. But my neighborhood has Comcast in it, and I have one of their boxes in my backyard. Well, they came in to do something to it, and they left the cover off and my back gate open. And so I just went on Twitter and said, hey, at Comcast Cares, WTH, you know? And somebody was calling me, or I mean emailing me, asking me for more information so that they could resolve the issue. So Comcast is another example of a company that's really said, this is where people are talking about us. This is It's important for us to not try to get people to come to us, but for us to go to them. The other case study that I want to talk about is Dell. I think Dell has done a great job of adjusting its approach to be able to continue its brand integrity, but do it in a way that engages customers and engages people. So Dell, does anybody remember Dell Health? So, do y'all remember that? I see you remember it, right? What was it? Just the nightmare of their tech support because they outsourced everything to India. Uh huh. And, and they I tried to do this on the pen for that was her whole day. And she had like a breakdown because of it. Yeah. It's so sad. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it was actually in the media called Dell Hell, right? And they were having so many issues with their customer service and their product. Goodbye. Thank you. Everybody. <laughs> Um, so they were having such issues with their products that they were, it was almost like a crisis response for them. But Michael Dell, again, like what Starbucks did with having a champion to mitigate the, the risks there, Michael Dell said, people are talking about us on the internet all the time. We've got to develop a strategy to reach out to them. And so they did. And they started with blogging. They started by reaching out to bloggers. And <laughs> I put this up here because Lionel, Lionel at Dell, who is the chief blogger for Dell, this is his favorite cartoon. And it just cracks me up too because it goes back to that dog and pony show, right? If I talk to you like a brand's going to talk to you, you'd probably punch me in the face. <laughs> or you'd want to, right? So they said, we've got to be conversational. We've got to be human. We've got to reach out to these folks and develop a relationship and be in a conversation with them. The other thing that they did was idea storm. And they actually bounced this idea from my Starbucks idea, right? So they have, have an internal idea storm that's called employee idea storm, and they have an external one too. And this is the same approach of how can we be a better company for you? How can we improve what we're doing because you're our customers and you have opinions about our products and it matters to us. So share your ideas and opinions with us and let's vote on those and, and see what ones we can implement. And so they took that the community approach as well. It's been very successful for them. The other part of it was, and I think that we see this in some companies where social media comes in and people go, well, that's just something else I have to do, right? Well, so was email like 10 years ago. Oh, I don't know about this email thing. It's just gonna, what about my memos, right? Well, people now, like the folks at Dell, they just get on Twitter a couple times a day and check to see, like, what's going on? What can I respond to? How can I be involved in this? So it just becomes another part of the job. It's just another way that people are gonna communicate, and it's just like email. They also modularize and synchronize content across the channel. So with the Dell Mini, that they were just launching a new version of. They had all of these channels participating and talking about it. 
They had a contest around it. But they really went into, we're not going to just use this as a Twitter effort. We're not just going to just do this on Ideas Form. We're not just going, to just going to do this in Facebook. We're going to look at all of these different areas and how can we get bloggers to talk about us and how can we get other people to talk about us on Twitter and how can we get retweeted and this and that. And so they really coordinated those efforts. There are some risks that you're going to hear. Bad news can spread just as fast as good. The thing um, out of the manifesto is that people are talking about you. They know about you. The cat is out of the bag. And they will tell the good, the bad, the ugly, the funny. They'll tell whatever they want to tell people about what they experience with you. This pitch and promote, a lot of times within social media. Now, I know you can use social media for public relations. You can use it for specific purposes. And as Bethany mentioned this morning, if you're going to be pitching a journalist, identify it that way. Don't try to disguise it. Um, and again, we talked about in the study, they, there's a correlation, but the direct traffic to sales doesn't, it's not A plus B equals C, but there is that correlation there. And sometimes I think, I think um, employers are afraid that if you're involved in social media that you're going to be not productive because you're chit-chatting all the time. Because that's kind of addictive. I'm addicted to Twitter. I'm addicted to Facebook. Um, it takes some time. You're going to have to experiment with it. But you can speed up your reaction times. You can get a worldwide focus. You can build your brand awareness. You can grow your network. And social media and SEO are kind of like BFS. Does anybody, has anybody seen this um, story about the dog and the monkey? Go Google it. It's really <laughs> sweet. I love this little orangutan and dog story. I'm not going to get into it, but go Google it. You'll love it. It's a sweet little video. It's called National Geographic. Um, some things that you want to do, though. You want to identify your audience, right? So you want to identify who it is that you're trying to reach. You also want to be able to identify what your objectives are and then identify what tactical approaches you're going to take to be able to reach your goals. But one of the things that's really, really important is you want to, when you get to this and you start reaching your goals, you want to measure it. Okay? Again, Radiant 6 is one of those tools that's going to be helpful in measuring it because it's a workflow tool and you can do a lot of sen sentiment around it. I wanted to share this with you and I have another one. Because if you're going to be looking at your strategy, you want to develop some tools that are going to help you do what Starbucks did in deputizing people, or what Dell did. And this is Dell's, this is their assessment. So why not Dell was nice enough to share this with me. Um, they have people who blog for Dell who aren't just Lionel. And they take them through kind of like a training class and teach them how to talk human, right? But there's also this tool that's available to them that they can say, okay, so I found something, what does it mean? How do I respond, right? And it's not just companies like Dell that are involved in this, because the Air Force figured it out too. And if the Air Force can figure it out, right, <laughs> then, you know, a branch of our military can figure it out, then obviously we've got something here that is going to be simple to use, and you're going to be able to deputize and get people across organizations involved in doing it and doing it in a way that the company and some of maybe the more conservative folks in the company are going to feel comfortable with because there's a tool that's involved in that. What I really want to get across is there's, there's a way to win with social media and branding. And these are across the board the rules of social media. you got to be transparent. You have to be authentic. And transparency is not just like tell all the secrets, but it's be human, be authentic, be who you are, um, but be ethical, right? So don't try to mislead somebody um, and protect if you're if you're doing it on behalf of your company or even if you're not, you know, and you're involved with the company, you're going to say something about that company. Protect that company's information. I mean, that's just a general, we all sign that confidentiality agreement when we start working for somebody, right? And a lot of companies will enforce discipline based on what their confidentiality rules are. But there is a way to fail, right? So if you don't plan, if you ignore criticism, you have to be willing to know that people aren't going to like something that you're going to do. And don't ignore it. Respond to it. One of the things that Dell told us was... Uh, Something that will go very far is saying, I'm sorry and thank you, 
right? Let people know you appreciate what they have to say, but if you screwed up, own it, right? Be, don't ignore that criticism. Don't set up a network where nobody can share. You talked a little bit about this, where it's not stagnant. It's not just like, here's our page and we're only gonna push this message out to you. Don't promote only your content. Let people promote the content that they want. We saw this with Starbucks, that they could talk about um, the, what drink they really enjoy. And they let them do that. They may even post on the, on the Facebook page or on the Twitter, hey, I really don't like Via. That was not very good. But they're not gonna hide that stuff. They're not gonna ignore that criticism. And don't spam. If you spam, it's a guaranteed way to just screw it up and fail. The ROI that you get now is based on the value of trust. So when you engage with your customers this way, you earn that trust and that's a return on influence. So you have people who are influential within their networks who are then able to vouch for you. Do I have any questions? I have like three minutes, two minutes. Really, no, any questions? I swear you can ask me. I can really fast. <laughs> Was this helpful to y'all? Did you find it interesting? Yeah? Okay, because I was really scared about that. Um, again, I'm Trish Bauer. I'm at Peanut Butter Jelly. And this is my Gmail. So feel free to write it down, shoot me an email if you do think of something that, um, that you want to ask. Or if there's any information that I can share with you. Because for me, the big part of social media is just knowledge sharing. So I don't know everything, and a lot of the stuff I got came from other things. So I want to, if I've learned something that can help you, I want to be able to share that information with you too. Are you sure there's no questions? Okay, I'm going to hook it. Thanks, y'all.